It is Sunday mailbag time right here. I hope you're ready for it. I'm Perry. I don't know who this guy is. I don't even (laughs) recognize him with a baseball hat. John Roca is not allowed to wear anything. Yeah. But a cowboy hat. Well, listen, let, let me clarify. First of all, this is a football hat. This is the L.A. Rams. <laughs> you know and... what I mean, a baseball style hat. I know the Rams. And it's Sunday, so it's going to be soon NFL time. So I'm just starting this out here. we got a lot of stuff going on at Collider Sports. So I'm getting in the mood. Okay, I yeah. okay, I know fine. we're talking movies today, though. I know that. But it's like, again, I've told you this. Yeah. You wear it well. But Thank you. you know when you see something a certain way, and then all of a sudden it looks a little different, and your brain just yeah. like can't compute. So yeah. I'm uh, having that now. But understood. One thing. Thing that did compute though is can you t- talk about that really cool postcard are you serious yeah, yeah absolutely i don't so, know i thought that was just really nice yeah we got this postcard i do host another sh- a podcast the top 10 show it's on the schmoes no podcast network uh matt nose and i got this uh postcard from a guy named jamail and uh he is he sent this from the south gobi desert he apparently takes a camel back and forth to work he's a teacher and he listens to the top 10 show back and forth to work uh, all the time and he's apparently going to take us with him as he goes on his travels as a teacher around the world promote you know he's going to promote the show but also listen to us so it was a really sweet postcard can you believe that it's not him on there but he sent it from the south Kobe desert That's so this cool. is basically him so, i love yeah, that it was really sweet it's very nice of him so all right thanks jamail before we roll into today's questions as always i must remind you we don't just exist on the youtube channel we are in podcast form as well under the movie talk feed you can check it out on the podcast one app or on itunes and then on top of that as you guys know, but you need to hear again and again, send your mailbag questions all over the place on Facebook, on Twitter, using the hashtag Collider Mailbag, also on Instagram, and then email, of course, mailbag at Collider.com. Send in some fresh new questions. Don't repeat questions. That's my, my top <laughs> advice right now. Don't send the same question over and over. That's it. We've got five great ones to hit today, and I'm going to read the first one. It is an email from Ryan Rosendale, who writes, Good day from Down Under in Australia. I recently watched James Ponsdolt's The End of Tour, the End of the Tour film and thought Jason Siegel really deserved more acclaim for his performance as David Foster Wallace. What are some other recent report performances that went under the radar? Stay sweaty. Well, if I'm allowed to nominate Andy Serkis again from the Planet of the Apes franchise, yeah, it goes. It didn't necessarily go under the note, but it didn't get nominated. And this is one that I harp on all the time because I really feel like his performance should be nominated. It's really great to bring this up. When you say stay sweaty, one of our most infamous battles that John Schnepp and I had was about Andy Serkis, whether he should be nominated or not. And John felt he shouldn't, and I felt he should. And shout out to John. He was trying to give a lot of love to the animators, the people that create the visual effects. I get that, but there's Still an actor underneath performing those lines, saying those lines, and doing those movements. Uh, a few more I would throw in there. Jake Gyllenhaal and Stronger, and Hathaway in Colossal. I thought she was fantastic in Colossal and what she was able to do. And Sylvia Hoax in Blade Runner 2049. You and I both loved her performance in mm-hmm. that movie, and I felt like she should have been nominated. And she's got great bangs as well, Perry. Um, she can rock those bangs. Those, those are not my, my style of bangs. Right. Um, so on my list, I've got Dan Stevens in The Guest. Oh, yeah, great uh, choice. I, I feel like The Guest made a lot of noise within a, a small genre mm-hmm. community, but it never really broke out beyond that, or at least as much as I think that it should have. And he is yeah. so good in that. Have you ever seen Obvious Child with Jenny Slate? I have not seen that That's yet. That's a great, great movie. That was okay. one of the first things that, you know, I knew uh, Marcel the Shell, but I never yeah. really Which seen. I've never really seen her in anything that big before, and that movie made me a huge fan of hers. And then, all right, so this one's cheating a little bit because he did get an Oscar nomination for it, but Viggo Mortensen in Captain Fantastic... Why did nobody see that? Somehow it got the nomination, but I feel like every single time I brought that one up while we were talking about Oscars that year, it's like, oh, I haven't seen that one yet. Go see that movie. I throw it in the Roman J. Israel pile, where people are like, he got nominated, but I don't know anybody who saw the movie. Well, but I I feel like Roman J., and I never wound up watching Roman J. Israel, but I I didn't wind up watching it because I kept hearing that he's great in it, but the movie isn't as good as he is in it, whereas Captain Fantastic, Viggo Mortensen is great in it, and the movie is great, too. I hesitated watching that, and then I watched it one day, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, so I, I, I echo Perry's sentiment. 
minutes about the movie. All right, let's move on. No, next... wait. Oh, wait. Oh. I want, I, can I finish my Oh, you list? got more? Oh, I, I didn't know you were still more. going. Of, I, I should have known. Just, Perry has 20 if choices. It's like, if it's under the radar and people that deserve credit yeah, yeah, for yeah. something that they Respect. didn't get enough credit Please. for, go ahead. I'll say Anne Dowd in everything. And that's oh, yeah. everything is not a movie. I just mean everything that she's in. <laughs> go see her in Hereditary. Go watch Compliance. Go watch uh, Handmaid's, Handmaid's Tale. Tale. She's yeah. so good. Have you ever seen the movie Don't Think Twice? Yes. That is another movie. Yeah. It is so, so good. It starts so many great people. Mike Birbiglia, uh, Gillian Jacobs, Keegan Michael mm -hmm. Key. Uh, so many great uh, comedic performances yep. in that movie, and an that, that's troop. another one that feels like nobody, it never really picked up enough steam, so yeah. that one, and then also uh, I have to throw in some love for Mark Duplass and Creep, because he is really, really mm -hmm. good and creepy in both of those movies. Yeah. Okay, and now I'm Tully good. as well, yeah. Tully is so good. Yeah, uh, all right, so we move on to, this is an email question from Liam. He writes, hey, long-time viewer since the Amorose day. Amy Shout Rose. out to Amy Rose. <laughs> uh, my question is, why do you usually talk about cash grab movies like a bad thing? The studios make money, which is 100% essential, and audiences get to see movies that they clearly want to see. But if Fox did more cash grabs, made more money, they would not have had to sell their company. Shout out to Liam knowing the inner workings of Fox Studios. But uh, what's your thoughts on this, Perry? I think there's a very big difference between a studio getting behind a movie that they think will do well financially mm -hmm. and a studio making a cash grab movie. Because yeah. cash grab is is grabbing at cash, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's just using something that's hot and popular right now to make some quick money without necessarily yeah. adapting it to screen in a way that really adds anything. Or or in most cases, you know, I'm thinking about, I mean, the Emoji movie comes to mm -hmm. mind. That could have been a really interesting uh, uh, visual interpretation of how we incorporate emojis in our yeah, lives. Yeah. And instead, it felt like a very surface level, a, a very obvious uh, version of what that story was going to mm -hmm. be. I say the same thing about Slenderman. The, sl the Slenderman, it, it felt to me like, again, a surface level interpretation of not even creepy pasta, but just of a boogeyman type figure. Yeah. Whereas there, there was so there was so much potential in dipping into the idea of creepypasta and what it means for 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 a myth to to continue to grow through people telling stories about it mm -hmm. on the internet and also just the whole idea of believability and how into something like that you could have gotten. So yeah. I think cash grab and a studio trying to back something that could make money and has that kind of potential, two separate things. Yeah, I'm not sure how much more I can add to that. The cash grab, what it does though is, I would throw this in, that it insults the fans a little bit because the fans of a franchise, the fans of a property, the fans of a character or a, a series of books see in a studio immediately swap up the rights and then not put the time, dedication, and effort and, and that extra bit of effort that you need to do to bring something to life with care and attention to detail, that bleeds through, the fans catch it, and they get upset because they see a studio that didn't have any, shouldn't have bought those uh, th those characters up or that property or franchise up if they weren't going to do it right. And so that's the insinuation of a cash grab. Yes, if you break it down to this basic definition, what you're talking about, sure, studios should want to have a cash grab because you want to make as much money as possible to stay alive, sure, but if you're getting a reputation for not doing well by these franchises, then you're gonna, then the audiences aren't gonna come to give you the money even when you do it right. Mm -hmm. So those are those things that you worry about. Whenever I talk about cash grabs, I always try to avoid, you know, calling a filmmaker lazy or calling something sure. thoughtless. But, but you know, I, I feel like those word those words apply. It's just I always feel like it's not fair to kind of point a finger at mm. you know maybe maybe uh, like an independent writer who who wrote right. a really great script or something or tried really hard and it yeah. got bought and then who knows what happened then. But you know the point is if uh, if something is considered a cash grab, it has an existing fan base. Yeah. And it needs to be brought to screen with it with a certain amount of uh, respect and care. Yeah, respect for the fan base, absolutely. All right, I'm ready for this one. All right. Somehow I landed uh, the longest uh, <laughs> mailbag question. All right, this is an email. It's an okay. interesting email, okay. and it comes from Colin. And Colin writes, "Hey, Collider crew." 
Something doesn't quite add up for me about Infinity War, which also ties into my brother's theory. First off, what I noticed was when Thanos is talking to Gamora about his planet Titan, he mentions how plentiful it is now. However, when we see Titan, it's all rubble and there is almost nothing left of it. This doesn't add up, especially when Thanos uses the reality stone to show Doc what it used to look like. My brother's theory is that Thanos was one of the ones who died. He uses the space stone right after the snap and a couple moments before the first one gets dusted. The next time we see him is admitting to little Gamora that it cost him everything. We then see him on the on the version of Titan. We only saw him explain to Gamora. Not sure what it means overall, but something isn't adding up with the condition of Titan. Hope to see you discuss this and keep up the great work. You know, one of my favorite games to play with friends, and especially when some alcohol is involved, is Jenga. And you start to stack things up, and then you wait for that one piece at the top uh, that could maybe make it all fall over. But the real way that you lose the game is trying to pull from the middle and put to that. And I think what you and your brother are missing, Colin, is that he was not talking about Titan. He was talking about Gamora's planet. He was saying that on Gamora's planet, his plan worked. On Titan, if you remember, he said that he was pushed out of Titan, that it, it, that they didn't want to follow his plan. Essentially, the Kal-El situation, or the Jor-El situation, where they didn't listen to him and Krypton was smashed to pieces. The same thing happened here with with Titan, they didn't listen to his crazy plan. Some people might think it's not so crazy plan uh, of eradicating half the population so they could live. He was saying he did what he did to so that Gamora's planet could live. That was the conversation they were having. So that's the thing that you're missing in this back and forth. And once you put that into the equation, it does add up. You have a strong Jenga tower that's not going to fall over. And so in the end, you can decide for yourself, though, if Thanos is right or wrong. More importantly, have you seen the video with the cat playing Jenga? Because it's incredible. <laughs> no, I will share that so you guys that. can all watch that. But that cat pokes some of the Jenga pieces from the middle, and it doesn't fall. Wow. But... I mean, that that is pretty much the answer yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I do like this question from a creative standpoint, though. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, we're, we're basically all sitting here. It's like, oh, Thanos killed everyone. How do they come back? But right. could you imagine if, if the person who enacted the snap actually became a bit like if everything yeah. was completely random and let's say the gauntlet didn't eliminate you from being picked for one side or the other mm -hmm. wouldn't it be kind of interesting if he fell victim to the to snap? His own snap yeah that would be interesting i don't know i just uh. think it's a very curious thing to to consider but yeah it it does not seem like that is a that's a possibility <laughs> here. no but I, I will echo echo one thing and that is that i enjoy the fans that go and take the time and create these theories they're fun to talk about. Yeah. They really are. And what Perry mentioned, yeah, it's a great, interesting, what if this did happen? How would he get out of it? Then the stuff that you wrote down, your brother's theory, would come into play as a possibility. It's so nerd deep that I really doubt the studios would do that, but it's certainly fun to talk about amongst the people like us who enjoy getting deeper and deeper into these uh, movies or into these situations within the movies. Well, so. it's also because I started to get wrapped up in, let, let's say he was a, a snap victim, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the theory right now is that uh, the snap victims go into the, uh, what, what's that, that realm called? Uh, yeah, the soul the, realm. The soul realm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, like, what does that even look like? Yeah, because right. what I initially pictured, especially when re-watching the end with mm -hmm. this question in mind, it's like maybe where he's talking to little Gamora right. is a representation of what that might look like. Mm -hmm. But then you can also think if those, if those individuals are trapped in the soul world slash Mm -hmm. dead mm -hmm. maybe they just have their their ideal version of what it is which yeah. is which is what that could be at the very end which yeah. which i find interesting but uh, yeah and what he says to gamora when it cost me everything to me i think he's saying everything being the only person he ever loved in his entire life which is gamora you know we didn't they didn't follow the infinity gauntlet comic book fully where you had hella and him trying to woo her so she stood in for that in a way and it did cost him everything was it all worth it? We'll find out, I guess, in Avengers. Oh, I can't wait Avengers until we get a teaser already. Four, it's right, killing right. me. All right, this one is another email from Lauren. Uh, she writes, Hey, Collider, with the backlash and hate that Kelly Marie Tran and Ruby Rose have received for their respective roles, do you think that actors, female and male, might start, might start turning away from roles in the sci-fi comic genre in TV or film? These types of stories have passionate fan bases, but those passions can easily slide over into trolling. Would an actor find the role or pay check worth it to get nasty comments love to the whole collider team i can't speak for these individual actors mm -hmm. out there but for me 
if I had the opportunity to have a really big role like that, mm -hmm. I might think twice given what it could do to your career yeah. going forward. Yeah. It's, and, and also, these individuals, they aren't just their career. They're also human beings. And, and we definitely get a taste of that here. Not not as much as they oh, do. Sure. But, Absolutely. you know, I mean, you always want to say, oh, have tough skin, leave all that stuff in the office. But the truth of the matter is you take some of it home. Mm -hmm. And th this kind of reaction can deeply affect someone. Right. So I definitely think that's part of the decision making process for anyone. And, you know, it, this this I think is more prevalent nowadays with how uh, how widespread the use of social media is and how vocal everybody is on social media at this point. But I still think that issues like this existed in the past in yeah. different ways where, you know, and it's not just about necessarily taking on that risk of getting backlash if you join a really popular franchise, mm -hmm. because I think that's existed from day one of anything continuing on. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's also uh, it's also the, the time mm -hmm. that you have to put into something like that. Yeah. I mean, nowadays you sign on for a DC Marvel or Star Wars movie, you are signing a contract for multiple films. So it's like, do you want to subject yourself to this kind of reaction? And do you want to give this gigantic chunk of your career to this one property. Yeah, and these are all great points you make, Perry. And you know, I don't think it's off base to relate it to what we do here or even the Schmodown. I know a lot of people have gotten into the Schmodown who come in to be contestants and had no idea, no matter how much you warned them, they had no idea of how some of the comments can come across on YouTube, uh, on, on Twitter, on Instagram, how their social media feeds are all of a sudden filled up with these kind of negative comments or trolling comments or toxic comments. A number of people have had issues with that and some people have not wanted to come back and do the Schmodown because of that reaction. Now, it's not all the fans, obviously. It's just a small amount. Just like here, that's a small amount. It's a small minority that are doing these things and trolling and have the time in their day to do these things in the, to, so consistently and so repetitively. But if I was an actor and I'm walking into a situation uh, uh, and, and I'm going to take this role, I think now you have to factor that in to your decision-making process because what you take for granted with 46 followers is flipping on your eyes iPhone, or flip on your phone, go into Twitter, go into Instagram, go into Facebook, or go into any social media app, and just looking and seeing your friends or seeing whatever they're doing. Well, how would you like it if all of a sudden you were famous and got this role? Then you can't even open those apps without hundreds or even thousands of negative comments that you've been tagged in about your performance, about your looks, about your personal life, about the decisions you make in the movies, all those kinds of things. So yeah, I and, and then if you signed on for three movies, you're signing up for almost six to nine years of this kind of uh, constant uh, b uh, barrage of comments or whatever on your uh, social media. So to me, I think you absolutely have to fact that. And that may come into play for a lot of actors not wanting to commit to these films because of that situation as well. I would not be surprised, and especially a lot of the female actresses. You know, we saw that already with Ruby Rose. Whatever your feelings are about her casting, you can feel however you feel. Yeah. You don't have to tag her. Kelly Marie Tran, your issues with Kelly Marie Tran, she had nothing to do with the script. She had nothing to do with creating the character, or maybe a little bit in collaboration, but she certainly didn't come up with the character. So she's just an actress. Ruby Rose, just an actress. If you all, if the people who are doing these toxic things could separate them, that would be so essential. But tagging them, like, think about that. You get hurt walking down the street if five strangers said, hey, you look fat today, or hey, I don't like that shirt, it looks terrible on you, or you do terrible at your job, that would overwhelm you. So yeah. yeah. Oh, it's sad when you put it that way. No, there's also, mean. you know, there's a, a pretty significant divide between, you know, I think everyone's in the right to uh, express some, I guess I would I would file it under constructive criticism or sure. or, or you know Absolutely. you know some of the things that I really do appreciate with what we do is when you know I'll say something on movie talk and then I'll go in the comment section and someone will say well we we disagree on that point and yeah. then they'll just explain to me why they disagree it's yes. not like like you idiot how dare you or right. anything like that I mean and that always uh, winds up paving the way to uh, what I think is a could be at least a really rich enlightening conversation oh, yeah. so if we just take out like <laughs> yeah. the evil and the name calling and the, the, the toxicity, that T word is so prevalent right now. I almost want to teach a course on how to effectively convey <laughs> displeasure with a casting choice that does not lead to toxicity or trolling or unhealthy back and forth. So I think 
people might actually legitimately, because sometimes people are surprised when you react to their words, not knowing that they're using these words in a way that are triggering or, uh, or negative. And so they're sometimes they legitimately don't understand how they're coming across. And maybe well, an online course teaching them that. That's also a, a very thing. human thing. I mean, yeah, think, about, think about everyday life. I, like, yeah. I might casually say something to someone else and just like not even compute that to right. them it could be offensive because it just sounds like, in my mind at least, a normal and very casual thing to say. Yeah, so it's yeah, like, yeah. I don't know, you can apply this thought and, you know, there, there's opportunities for, for growth in that respect. If I said something like that that offended someone in my everyday life, right. I would want them to call me out on it just so I could process it from their standpoint. Exactly, yeah. All point. right. We got one more question. Yeah, let's you ready do it. for this one? This is my question. <laughs> this is no, an email. You don't say. It's an email from Sean. And Sean writes, I've got to ask, how have you not covered <laughs> Power Rangers 2 happening? So I, I had to pick this question because... This feels like constructive criticism. <laughs> a little, well, not, not, not exactly, but uh, I had to pick this question because yeah. when that the whole licensing uh, information oh, yeah. got out, mm -hmm. I've gotten like dozens, if not cracking a hundred tweets being wow. like, how are you not more excited about this? And it's because I don't think it's it's too accurate. Do you want to dump in before well, I, I rip this apart? No, I feel like you should handle this question and I'll react to whatever you say because, right. I, I, you know, uh, I, yeah. So my, my, big, my big takeaway from this is that, and, and this applies to, I think, every film, uh, every brand out there, mm -hmm. is the, the film side and the, the licensing side, I think, are, are two different things. And the reason why the whole Power Rangers 2 thing came back into the conversation, like, so hot with so much fire behind it, is because of the whole, uh, there was a licensing call. And I think that in the original report, which I don't remember who the first person that caught this was. This mm -hmm. is a couple weeks ago now. But the, the sentence that everybody was focusing on was, uh, I, I believe it's Hasbro will work with a Hasbro will work with a film studio to develop a new Power Rangers movie as a follow up to the 2017 release. This came from a, a licensing report. Mm. So, yeah, I think I think that may be accurate to a degree, but it's like then you could start nitpicking the word. So, of course, of course, big fat duh. Hasbro is going to work with a film studio right. to make another Power Rangers movie. There is no no doubt in my mind that that will happen eventually. Yeah. Not right now. And even when I focus in on the last end of that quote, which is a Power Rangers movie as a follow-up to the 2017 release, that the structure of that sentence does not guarantee in my mind that this is going to be a follow-up like equating mm -hmm. to sequel to the 2017 Power Rangers movie. Because right. technically, any Power Rangers movie that comes next is, in a sense, a follow-up. So I think that Power Good Rangers point. at this point in time, and I have no inside information. This is just me kind of gauging the conversation right now. And also where Hasbro, Allspark, and Paramount, uh, you know, their, their, uh, their brains are, where, what mm -hmm. they're focusing on most at this point in time. I don't think that there is much of any movement on a Power Rangers movie except maybe light early development behind the scenes to see what could come up down the line. I do not read any of this as we're getting Power Rangers 2 specifically in the near future. Well, there you go. And I think that's why you haven't covered as powerfully or we haven't covered as powerfully as Collider because it is not necessarily in motion. Something's going to happen once it starts to actually, you know, move toward, have to take some concrete steps towards it actually happening, then I'm sure we'll cover it. I'm sure Perry will spearhead that coverage. <laughs> Absolutely. So when that happens, then we'll, we'll look at it. But to me, it's great that there's excitement to it. I mean, yeah. you know, because people love this franchise, love this property. And it doesn't mean it'll be a Power Rangers 2 that comes out in the theaters. It could be Netflix, could be any number of streaming services. You never know how it's mm. going to, how it's going to come out. Could be a TV movie. Who knows? But either way, it, you like the fact that they're going to go forward with it in some form. You just don't know yet. You don't have any concrete details yet of what form it's going to take. If I had to make a bet right now, I would bet again. Against, uh, TV or streaming because okay. I, I do think that they're going to work this into this whole, you know, all spark uh, Hasbro cinematic universe right. in a way. I do also think it is highly unlikely that we're going to get a direct sequel to the 2017 movie. Yeah. And I do. I do think that uh, were you on the show when I was talking about the prop that I just bought? 
No. I think that the prop auction was was a sign because oh, in most okay. cases, I think you would hold on to a lot of that stuff yeah. if you're if you're going to continue. But uh, they did a prop auction. A lot of that stuff was was sold. Wow. I, I am the proud owner of a power coin. And <laughs> I, I think that's a sign. And also, you know, when you think about a. When you think about it going to a new studio and then working it into another cinematic universe, mm -hmm. I get as much as I love the 2017 movie, it is a smarter play for them to mm -hmm. start with a with a clean slate. Yeah. Let them do creatively whatever they want to do. I agree. Yeah, that's I think that's the best way to put it to be honest with you. Yeah. Oh, wow. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's it. Roka, as always, it was a blast doing mail yeah, with thank you. you. Thank so you for having. being here. Thank you out there to everybody who sent in a question. And to everybody who's watching this video right now, do not forget to like and share it. That would be wonderful. And also, keep an eye out because we have so much content coming your way tomorrow, including Movie Talk Live at 4 p.m. PT. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.